Hey, everybody. If you want the full uncensored episode, be sure to click the link below to join the Fight Club on Patreon. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. Tony Twist is left wing. His bench is kind of right behind him. And sure, Tony tries to go over the the halfway point for the faceoff, and and I don't like it. So I give him this one, and he he what? And until the refs get over there, they blow the whistle, they sort us back out, you know. And he's like, "I'm gonna freaking kill you, you little son of a whatever." And I'm laughing at him, you know, because again, I'm too dumb to be scared. And um, I got this little trick that I like to use on guys like that. So I just put my skate right on the top of his boot. And as soon as the puck drops, I push really hard and it makes him fall forward flat on his face. So I did it to perfection. Maybe the best one I've ever done. <laughs> he gets up and his gloves are off before his head hit the ice. And he's coming up after me. And I had Jeff Norton on the back end. He saw everything that was going on. He jumped in between. The refs get over there as fast as they can because Twister would have killed me. But he never really <laughs> got to me to, to be able to kill me. That'll be a suspension. That'll be a fine. Nyland going ballistic. He's a freaking madman. I'm Chris Nyland, and this is the Raw Knuckles Podcast. Thanks for joining, uh, Tony. Appreciate it. Uh, Tim and I... Yeah, Buster must have did some curls today because he's, he's, he's. Oh yeah, I always wear the tight shirt. Looks like you know, tight suit. Extra, extra medium, extra medium. <laughs> extra medium. <laughs> Buster, I still, I, I have still yet to call him Buster. Yeah, you gotta be. Yeah. I don't like... call him Whitey. I don't call him Buster. I call him Tim. Yeah. Tim. I don't okay, know what it Tim. is. We go way Can back. I call him Buster Tony today, or if I allowed to. We go way back. Look call him whatever is, you want. Look today. at this picture I found, Tony. You got. I'm going to show Donnie, but this is back when I was like 10 years old at your camp. Holy that's, cow! That's me and Tim McNamara, and then it's like you, Donnie, and uh, Gary Shushuk, I think. Yep, it's Shuey. How cool is that? Wow! I know. Wow! Right there. Good that one. says a lot to me. That's why you ended up in fucking Russia, Tim. Right there. You went to their <laughs> hockey school. <laughs> Well, I thought you were going to say about the age difference, how old I am. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Oh, That's pretty shit. good. Oh, oh Tone, awesome to have you. And listen, um, you know, Hockey Hall of Fame, uh, U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame, I, I was watching um, a YouTube clip, you know, last Uh-oh. night, and I, I went over it again today. There's, there's a, uh, a thing on there, YouTube, Tony Granado, U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame, class of 2020. Congrats, by the way. Thank you. But I start watching it, and, like, the first four goals on it are me fucking assistant on your <laughs> shit. My first, my, I yeah, that. we got, yeah, we, um, you assisted on my first one. And you assisted on. Uh, we played together. You can't remember us <laughs> playing together. Yeah, well, that I was do, so but bad. you don't remember playing with me. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. I remember playing with you, but I didn't know I was so Gretzky like when I was playing yeah. with you. <laughs> we had a little chemistry, Nux. We oh. did. I was scared oh, of shit of you when you gave me crap that one time for almost getting in a fight. So I had to make sure that I played well when I played with you. I was shocked. I'm like, holy shit! I, I could actually there play I a little am. bit. Uh, yeah, saucer anyway, passes and everything. Uh, great Thank to have dogs. you. Great, great to see you. You know, we go back to uh, playing days, obviously, but we go back further than that. We didn't know it. Uh, at least I didn't. Um, I, I went to <laughs> Northwood School, and you went to Northwood School, and as That's I found correct. out afterwards, but <laughs> you know, I, I was talking to Tim about that, and. My senior year at Catholic Memorial in Boston, I had nowhere to go. It was my senior year. I was 17 years old, most of my senior year. My, my birthday was in February. And I did not have a clue where I was going to go with my life. All these other kids are going off to college. You know, it, the family had money, uh, whatever. I was going nowhere. And uh, I had never gone into the guidance office till my senior year. I seen that sign so many times. I'm like, ah, I don't need guidance. I'm fine. I know everything. So I go in, and my coach was the guidance counselor for the seniors that year, Coach Bill Hanson. I went to coach. And I said, "Geez," I said, hey, "Everybody's going off to college. I'm fucking going nowhere. I'm out of here in a month." You know, all of a sudden I'm in panic mode. 
He goes, well, do you have a, you're a young senior. He said, why don't you look at maybe going to prep school for you on there? Prep school, what's that? And he named off a few, and Northwood was one. So I got my ducks in a row. I applied. He helped me apply. I applied. I had a good reference from Judge, Judge Paul King, um, Coach Hanson, stuff. I, I ended up going off to Northwood. It was a turning point in my life. It was huge as far as where I ended up in my in my career as a as a player in my life. How how big an impact did that place have on you? You went for two years. I went for one. I absolutely loved that place. You know, I grew up in the city. I got there and I'm like, my parents dropped, my father's dropped me off, right? And he's going to drive out the school. I'm there, let me off here, let me off here. He said, why? I said, let me off here, will you? And I want, because I was I'm fucking going to cry like a baby. So let me clean my eyes up before I walk in the building and put on this fucking tough guy attitude when I walk in there. I don't want to walk in crying. <laughs> Fuck. But what an impact it had on my life uh, when I look back. I, you know, it took me some time to recognize that, obviously. But how about you? Yeah, I think the same thing, Knox. And uh, the fortunate thing for me is I went after you so I could hear all the Chris Nyland stories <laughs> and all the stuff that you did while you were there uh, that are legendary stories. You and Jay Miller were before me. You and Jay Miller. Yeah, so Jay was I, after I, me. I think I because he was after you and then I came after Jay. So I think I was yeah. the third player from Northwood to go to the NHL. I think we had different styles, you two guys and me. But uh, yeah. it was uh, – it was a place, like you said, uh, that had an impact on my life that as I was going through it, I probably didn't realize how special it was. But academically for me, um, I was a good student, but I didn't love school. And when I was in Chicago before I, I went out to prep school, uh, I played hockey, I want to say 24 hours a day. I didn't care about going to class. I didn't care about doing homework. I cared about being at the rink and being on the ice. And um, for Americans at, our, uh, at that time, our only option was to try to go to college and get a college degree and play college hockey. We thought that was really cool. We had really, to, to make it to the NHL was an extremely long shot at that time. So college hockey was the NHL for us. So the only way for me to get into college and get ready for college would have been, like you said, to find a different route and some bridge, so to speak, uh, to be ready for college. Uh, and fortunately for me and Steve Reed, and I know you know Reno, Reno. Uh, a legendary yeah. guidance counselor there that's still involved with Northwood. Uh, he probably, you know, along with my parents and a couple other coaches, would be a top five uh, a person in my life that has impacted it in a positive way uh, more so than anybody. So I, I look back on those days and the guidance that he gave me and the direction he gave me and the confidence he gave me as a student athlete to be able to recognize that, you know, to be a great athlete, to, com to combine school and academics with it, it's only going to help you down the road. And, and that was a really uh, powerful, you know, statement one. And then the experience that I had there, I can't, you know, I can't say how wonderful it was. I played with Mike Richter's brother, Joe. Joe was yeah. our goalie. Uh, and then Mike ended up coming the year after I left. And then when I got to Wisconsin, I told the coaches about Mike and we ended up getting Mike to Wisconsin. And then uh, everybody knows what Mike did after that with the Olympics and the world championships and the uh, Stanley cup with New York and all of that. Uh -huh. So there's another one that benefited from Northwood school as well. Yeah. It's funny, Tim, uh, Tony mentioned Mr. Reed and he, he was just an awesome guy. Just everybody loved this guy at the school. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but he lived on campus. Tim. He did. But after Mike Richter had all the success he did, and I don't know if you were involved in this, apparently they built him a house right on campus there, didn't they? That's correct. Mike, did, you, Mike did all of that. No, Mike, Mike did, did all that. that. Incredible, yeah, huh? Yeah, that yeah. like that when I heard that story, I'm there, God damn. Yeah, and he was the best hockey players are special. They're special. Yeah. yeah, he went back and looked at the impact that he had on his life. Uh, saw the conditions Reno was living in and said, Reno, we're going to upgrade you, uh, put him in a place. And, and like I said, Mike, uh, Reno was Mike's best man in his wedding, which, uh, which yeah. 
shows the, the amount of character and what kind of person he is. When you're, uh, you know, getting married, you, you, you ask your guidance counselor to be your <laughs> best man. And that was really cool. What a story that is. I, I it, was that your only that. option? That was like back, like Illinois today is a huge hockey state, right? Like back when, even when I was like growing up, it was okay. But that was your only option was to get out of Illinois, right? Unfortunately, it was, uh, Timmy. It was, um, you know, there we had decent hockey. You know, it was, but it wasn't like Eddie Olchek made it. Chris Chelios obviously played a little bit in the Illinois area before he went to San Diego and then on the Moose Jaw and stuff. Uh, we had a couple other players, Ricky Zombo, Steve Richmond, that kind of found a way to, to make it. But really, it was hard. Uh, there weren't a lot of scouts that would come into Chicago to watch us. It was Boston. It was Minnesota. It was Michigan. Those three places were the three hockey special areas uh, in the country. And, and uh, so you look and see where the games come today, and you got kids coming from Florida, from Phoenix, from St. Louis, for, I mean, all over the place. And back then, we were regional. We were a regional sport. So, yes, I happen and you happen to grow up in, a, in an area that we loved hockey as much as everybody else, but the opportunities to, to go beyond uh, our state were really difficult. So going to prep school was, was probably the, the best option, and it worked out well for me. Where were you going before that? Down as Grove Central or something? Downers Grove North. north. Controls. Come on, Timmy. I think we won the There's state There's like five of them. I don't know. Downers <laughs> North Trojans. Yeah. What was oh, your high school? Fenwick. I went to Fenwick. Oh, yeah. I knew that. I knew that. Yeah, yeah. Is that Bishop Fenwick? <laughs> no. No, because there is one in Mass. There's a, a Bishop Fenwick in Massachusetts. Yeah. I mean, I it was, was a Catholic wondering. high school, Fenwick Catholic yeah. high school. But maybe, it was Bishop Fenwick. It was Catholic high school in Mass. It was a very well-respected school, Chris. He had to be on his best behavior. Yeah, yeah. I'm that. sure. Oh, yeah, Busta? Yeah. You mean Busta? <laughs> on his yeah. best behavior? Yep. Yep. Uh, so I tried out the regional tryout for the 1980 Olympic team, okay? Um, I did get to represent my country at one time in the Canada Cup, which was awesome. You have. You played, the, you played in the watched. Olympics. It was an, right. incredible. Incredible. Yeah, you were 87 with Chelios yeah. and Scooter yeah. and all those guys. Yeah, yeah. I watched it. Yes. And 80, actually, actually, Badger Bob kept me over Brett Hull. Mm -hmm. He cut I Brett Hull that. because, because well, he cut him because he was overweight. And I, I told the story before that Tim don't want, probably want to hear it again. But, uh, fuck, it, it, Brett Hall went in the newspaper and kind of disparaged me. Like, can you imagine? They fucking kept nihiling over me. And I'm like, sorry, Brett, you were a fat fuck. And you couldn't move on the ice. Yeah, maybe you could score goals, but you were a fat fuck at the time. And he was. And Badger Bob had him in Calgary, and that's one of the things. He couldn't, he couldn't get him to lose weight. So, anyway, they kept knuckles, and I kept up my end of the deal. But. Are you ready to take your love for hockey to the next level? Join the Fight Club Raw Knuckles exclusive Patreon to unlock amazing perks like ad-free episodes, bonus interviews, and even a chance to win a game day experience with me in the Habs Cave. Don't miss out on this ultimate hockey experience. Anyway, not about me. It's about you and your family. Is it, was that like a... How does the Granado family... I mean, Cammy, your brother Donnie, you're all into the hockey thing. How does that happen? And and where did that fire get lit for the Granado family? One of the premier names in USA hockey, you know, the Johnsons, uh, the Granados. Uh, how does that happen? Uh, well, thanks, Knox. I, I, first of all, um, the one thing that we had uh, as young kids, and there's six of us, there's five of us within six years, uh, the one thing we had, uh, well, a couple of things. One, we all loved hockey, including my parents. Uh, and two, we had our parents that understood that, okay, uh, this hockey thing is a little bit crazy because that's all we wanted to do all day. Uh, we, you know, just like all the other hockey kids, young kids, you beat your house up and you got to get up at five in the morning and your parents need to drive you to the rink and you need all this equipment. And you got to, you know, you don't get summer vacations because you don't have any money left to go on summer vacations because you spend it all on hockey. My parents were understanding that this was special and it was special to us. And they gave us the opportunity to all, uh, you know, play it at a really young age. And Cammy's the one, I think, 
that when I look back on the experience, um, for my parents to recognize back then, you, you know, this girls, you know, did you ever have a girl on your team, Knox or Timmy, when maybe Timmy, you might have, uh, did no, you ever, I never did. Never. Yeah. A and couple so guys have back in the day that, okay. I know okay. where it's going. <laughs> yeah. I know where it's going. Uh, but, I won't go there. <laughs> but we, you know, had a sister that played and I didn't really realize how unique it was until we get out to the rinks and I would hear parents going, what the heck is a girl doing on the other team? Run that girl. And I'm like, first of all, you try and run her. She'll, she'll, <laughs> she'll knock your son right on his keister. Uh, that's one. And two, I, you know, I go, I go, man, oh man, she just wants to play hockey. She loves hockey. So all that she fought through and all the girls from that era, uh, what they had to do to play the sport that they love was really uh, kind of admirable from when you look back on, that time and so i i learned a lot from her just from her courage of being able to walk into a boys locker room and say hey i'm on your team or walk onto the ice and have parents screaming at her you know that this shouldn't be going on uh and and so we kind of rallied around each other you know we played games and i'm sitting in a basement right now my basement right now in our basement at home was our sanctuary we'd go down those stairs yeah. every single day and we'd play full contact, all out Stanley Cup games in the basement. And we made each other tougher. We made each other better. Uh, we taught each other about competitiveness, about leadership, about uh, brotherhood, whatever it is. Though That's where we got our, uh, our values of what helped us when we did have uh, opportunities when life moved forward. So I'm grateful for that. So I, I I'm not trying to brag about my family. I'm just just really proud of the fact that I had siblings and parents that loved hockey as much as I did. And because of that, we're all still in the game. We still, every time we talk to each other or see each other, Timmy knows we saw I my two brothers. Two of my brothers were uh, together last week at a Stanley Cup party for Billy Zito. And, you know, we hockey's every day. Our niece was there. My, my wife was there. We, we just, it's family, it's hockey. So, so that's just the part I think we, we love hockey and we were fortunate enough to continue to have that be a big part of our life until this day. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that is awesome. And, and Cammy, obviously the captain, the Olympic team, uh, we know the great career she had. She went to Providence. But she also went to Concordia. What happened there with Cammy that she went to both? What, what so was that? When, this is an interesting story. So obviously there was there was no Olympic women's hockey till 1998. And I think she finished at Providence a couple years before that. And in 1992-ish, there started to be rumors that potentially women's hockey would be a um, – what do you call that? Like an experimental sport in the next Olympics. Uh, kind of, I forget what they call it. And, and anyhow, uh, so she said, geez, maybe I'll get a chance, you know, uh, to, to potentially play for my country in the Olympics, but I got, I don't have anywhere to play once she finished Providence. So Concordia and in, in the Canadian colleges, uh, you can go there and there's, I guess there's no limit on how many years you play college hockey. So she went there to play a couple years of college hockey just to stay ready. Extend and her that, career, right? Extend her career yeah. in case the Olympics came around and sure enough, 1998, and I don't know, I think, I, I think probably 1996, it was determined that women's would have a, a chance to compete in the Olympics and, and it would be a regular sport. And that's where women's hockey started. And it was in, in uh, Japan, the Olympics in Japan. Nagano. And, and Nagano, thank you. And it was, it was, uh, you know, really a chance for us as a family uh, to kind of celebrate you know, something that we never thought was going to happen. Like Cammy dreamed of being in the, on the Chicago Blackhawks, just like we all did when we grew up in Chicago. And and at some point, you know, I don't know if we had to tell her, or she realized, geez, there's no women playing <laughs> for the Blackhawks. The NHL. Yeah. And the NHL. And uh, so having an opportunity to play in the Olympics uh, for her was certainly uh, deserving. And the same. Now, now you look at women's hockey and you're just amazed. <laughs> Some of these women you think potentially someday might be able to play you professional hockey. You never know. They are darn good. So well, it's she's come done one better, right? She's what is she, assistant GM, you said? 
She's assistant GM in Vancouver. Uh, there's, there's lots of women that have joined uh, different staffs. There's a couple on coaching. Dan Balsma hired a coach now in Seattle, assistant coach there. There's lots of women in player development, uh, lots of, uh, uh, you know, diversity from the uh, – management side and coaching side now that you're seeing women become a, a regular part of uh, front offices. I want to have Cammy on, by the way, I'm de- but I'm asking you these questions. I want to ask her, but, um, you know, she got invited to the Islanders training camp. She declined. Do you think that was because she thought it was kind of like a PR thing more than anything? Yeah. or? I that, know that for sure. Exactly. She yeah, came right? to me when she, yeah, it was, it was, it was Mike Milbury. It was, it yeah. was the right idea. Women's yeah. just, you know, women's hockey was just getting going. She was the best player, the most recognizable name uh, in women's hockey. They just won the gold medal. Uh, and, you know, when, when she got the call or, or a notification that the Islanders wanted to do that, you know, she, she was pretty honest with herself and, and she asked our opinion, you know, as from brother's standpoint, you know, you think this is a good idea. And, uh, you know, I think when she realized that it was more of a, a you know, it would have been, I think it would have been a good thing. Menno Rayon did it not too long after that and went to Tampa Bay. And as a goalie, I think it's, it was more appropriate uh, with the less physical contact, it's still grueling to be in, you know, standing in front of 100 mile an hour slap shots and that. But, but I think that was a better uh, idea for the first woman to to jump into a training camp. But, but it was an honor for her to be invited, and I think she made the right decision to say, "I'm not quite ready for that. I've got some other things that I think are more important at the time." And, uh, but it was still. I'm, I'm glad you. I forgot about that too. I remember. Right. Like, hey, you told me you got invited to the New York Islanders training camp. What do you think? Right. Yeah. Um, like, what well, year was that? What year was that? It would have been um, probably 99. 90, or right? so, yeah, it was. Late I mean, 90s. Late 90s, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, it was 97. Um, it was. Okay, right. Before 97. And she, you know what? She was tough enough. Like, I mean, I, I wasn't worried about her getting hurt or tough enough. Uh, but she still, I mean, I don't know, 135 pounds. I mean, yeah. I was 165 knucks when I got the training camp with I know. the Rangers. Uh, way too small and light to be thinking that I could compete. You can at fly. That. You can fly, though, brother. Yeah. Well, that was the one thing I had was if, if I – and I always Two thought things. of that, too. I, yeah, and you had some beef on the wing. Yeah, beef, I had on, beef the wing. on the wing. There's no doubt about that. But I had a mentality of, you know, yeah, there's a lot of big guys on the other side, but they can't skate like I can. So as long uh-huh. as I didn't let them catch me and I didn't stop, they, they wouldn't be able to get me. Yeah, and then beef, if they beef, get beef, me, beef that me. can dish too. You can dish too. <laughs> dish. Don't forget that, Timmy. Thanks for bringing that back. But but the great thing about being a small player, and Nux, I've said this to you. I've been on your show before, and we talked before yeah. about this. You can't be a small player and and be what you want to be unless you've got people behind you that are going to back you up. And for, you know, I was very fortunate. My first team, Chris Nyland, was my backup. And his job was way harder and way more important than my job was. I was a small, skilled player that was supposed to contribute offensively and do my thing. But I don't do that unless Chris Nyland's there to protect me. And I don't mean protect in the sense that he had to be standing by my side to defend me in all situations. But if anyone did do anything to me, uh, he'd look at him and say, you touch him again. I'll, you know, the best thing that you did, Nux, which I learned from you, I'll kill you and I'll kill your best player too. And that mentality, this is where I learned when I got, when I started to play with Gretz and I was, you know, I became a dirty player, so to speak, and somebody that people wanted to get to and chase around. And that was an asset when I played with Gretz, because if I'm on the ice with Gretz and they're all worried about me, guess what? Gretz scores, yeah. you know, five goals that night. So that was an asset. But when they said to me, you do that again, I'm coming after Gretzky, I had to stop. I can't, yeah. I can't do anything because if they went after Gretz, Gretz would kill me too. So, <laughs> so uh, I mean, that's where you neutralize the opponents to be able to allow me and other skilled players to do their thing. And, and in today's game, and when you watch sports, I don't think – people that haven't played quite understand what that means. Uh, but, but, uh, when you're part of a team and you're, uh, there's, everybody has their role and your role was, um, is important. And this is the thing that as a coach, the role of that player as, as important or more important than the skilled guy, because the skilled guy can't do his thing unless there is somebody there that will protect him, 
uh, and let the other team know that you will not take any liberties at all and you allow him to do his thing. Especially so thank back you. In, especially yeah, back thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words. I appreciate it. But this is about you, not me. And Cammy, Calling all hockey lovers. Upgrade your podcast experience by becoming an enforcer. Gain access to the greatest hockey doc ever, The Last Gladiators. And don't settle for ordinary. Join the Fight Club over on Patreon today. Tom, uh, remember Igor Lieber? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Igor Lieber. I always tell the story, right? Well, I the had train him day. Over. Yeah, the yeah, day. yeah. I had him <laughs> over. For... No, no, I like it here. Yeah. No, he said he, he – um, I had them over for dinner, right? They couldn't speak a lick of English, him and the wife or the kid. And I, they were over my house for dinner. And they, I just, I felt bad for the guy. And Phil's trying to trade him. So he pull, pulls him out of the room and tells me he's traded to LA and blah, blah, blah. And I come out, Phil grabs me. He says, you got to help me with this. He he won't go. You got to tell him he's got to go. He's been traded. So I come out and I'm there. Hey, Igor, you got traded. This is the NHL. Yeah, and Phil told me, he said, tell him he's going to play with Gretzky, you know. And fuck, I'm mean, going to play with Gretzky, you go. You're going to play with Gretzky. He said, fuck Gretzky. Me want to play with Knuckles, he told Phil. <laughs> Phil almost, like, he fucking fell on the floor. He was like. I did not that? know that line. Yeah. I just, I, I he remember. He said, fuck saying, Gretzky. Me want to play with Knuckles. Yeah. It, it I was remember like, the line he said. He said, uh, no, Phil. Me and what was his boy's name? Uh. <laughs> Remember his kid's name? No, e- Whatever Igor was, Jr. <laughs> Igor Jr. Like it here. We stay in New York. We not go yeah. LA. My Igor yeah. like it here. Whatever it was, yeah. that that was one of his lines too. You yeah. tell Phil. Oh, I remember that. Like it was, I, and the funny thing is, we were playing LA that night, so he was supposed to go over to the other yeah. dressing room. Dean Kennedy was supposed to come to our dressing room, and they were supposed to play against each other. Exactly. And then what ended up happening was they, they nullified the trade for a few hours, and they completed it after the game, so both those guys didn't have to play against their old team. I think yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, it is. Um, just crazy, but um, those days. The great and- world of being a professional <laughs> athlete, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was off to Boston already, but you got traded with Thomas Sanson to L.A. for, for Bernie. Now, um, Bernie was a great player, no question. I just think Phil made some bad trades, and he did. Uh, everybody does, but that was a bad one. Um, I love Thomas. Can I, love can I interrupt really quick? I want to right interrupt. Ahead. Here's why it's a good trade, okay? Well, if they don't I, make that trade, they might not be able to make the trade with Edmonton for Messier because Bernie was part of the trade that brought Messier to the Rangers. So maybe it would have been me going to the, you know, Edmonton and for yeah. Messier. I doubt it. Bernie had 80 some goals or whatever he did. Right. So he, he was a high uh, sought after player because of his goal scoring ability. So I think all of that, you know, maybe at the time, I don't know, whatever. I, you know what? Did Phil make that trade or did Neil Smith? Neil might have made it. No, it was Neil. I might have been traded. Uh, but wait, that's okay. Wait. But it's a great trade. Well, yeah, Smitty was there by then, right? Smitty was because because Phil. Yeah, yeah, after he Phil was. Phil Sorry. Yeah. Four days yeah. before playoffs started. Ma- right? Before. Yeah. 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 No, two days before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was April Fool's. We thought April it was Fool. a joke, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Phil Esposito still mad at me because – I went to jo- John Davidson and asked me, what do you think of the trade? I said, I mean, what do you think of the coach being fired? I said, I don't like it. I love playing for him. I said, I go through, a, for, I go through the wall for a guy like that. Phil got pissed at me. I can't believe you said that. Uh, I mean, what do you mean? That's fucking how I feel. You know, like I was like, hello. I think we all did. Yeah. We all did. You know, it was, it was, we went through a struggle. We had some injuries and we had a great start to that year. And we were struggling a little bit towards the end, but I think we, you know, going into the playoffs, certainly we would have been a lot more organized had we had we stayed with the same coach rather than two days yeah, two, two days, days before. Bill, Bill fired him on a Saturday morning, coached Saturday night, Sunday night. We lost both them and then lost four straight to the Penguins. Crazy, <laughs> crazy six. Oh, yeah. you know, it, and I I think back to geez, I had a terrible time in New York and because of my injuries, right? My last four years, Tim, I I missed like two hundred games, right? I broke my arm twice. I tore my knee ligaments. I had the hockey hernia. Then I went to Boston. I ended up breaking my ankle. Like, I missed a lot of games. I had 688 games 
and and I missed Christ. I missed probably in my career two hundred and fifty because of injuries. Like I would have been close to a Geno, which I always wanted to play that thousand game mark, but I never got there. Anyway, regardless, I I I was. I was kind of beat up by the end of New York, and I was just kind of hanging on my body. But um, anyway, Knuckles, it's not about you, Knuckles. Can, I, refer, can I cut in on you again? Right I like cutting in on you. Yeah, Go, yeah. Cut in. I love that. This is a conversation. Yeah, it's a yeah. conversation. But so, okay, the, the, the thing that I liked about that example that you set, and, it, of course, I would have loved to see you play a 1,000 games, but you can't play a 1,000 games when you play the way you do. I don't think I could have played a thousand games the way I played either because what you said about, you know, going through the wall for your coach, my mentality was that exact same thing. And I think that's why uh, as teammates and somebody that I learned from, from you is I don't care what the coach said. I don't care what anybody else said about what I did. I I cared about what Chris Nyland and the rest of my teammates thought I was as a teammate and I would go through the wall for each other. And because of that, we didn't tiptoe around and try to, you know, polish it up to say, hey, we got to play, be a little bit cautious here so we can play more games. We went as hard as we could, as long as we could, and wherever that brought us to, we were happy with. So so I would I would be very proud of what you did in 688. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. That's, that's a hell of a run, buddy. So, wow. so uh, that's a, a – What, what, what that were you did. drafted, like 700th or something? Uh, 700. <laughs> that's no, a good pick. <laughs> 231 out of 235. I was. We played almost. Right. Five, fuck. We played almost 700 games. That's amazing. Crazy. And yeah. you did a lot more in 688 than everybody did that's played 1500 games. I'll tell you that. So thank you. Listen, you always were a guy that had your shit together, and it, you know you were uh, you're a good person. And it, how difficult was the transition for you when you first got out? Because Tim and I talk to guys all the time about this. I struggled with it. I had a difficult time. Uh, well documented. What was it like for you? All of a sudden, loving that game that you love your whole life, the family, everybody's involved in hockey, and then the transition out. Uh, how long did it take you to get going again? Until I got back in. It was a struggle. Like yeah. I retired. I retired, which I thought were for the right reasons, for my family. All right. Yeah. So I, I was hurt the year before. I had a shoulder surgery. Uh, and then Dean Lombardi, who was really, really great for me and really honest for me at the end of that year, he said, Tone, listen, I'm not going to sign you. I, I just, I got too many young kids here, uh, that I have to play next year. You've been great for the organization. Uh, but I, I want to be honest with you now, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cut you loose and let you, you know, try to go play somewhere else. But if you want to stay in San Jose and, and, you know, start to jump into the management side of things, we can try to help you on that side. And I thought that was really classy of him to do that. It was uh, nice, right? Uh, it was nice. Uh, yeah. But I, I looked at a couple teams. I really wanted to come back and play in Chicago where family was. Uh, so I tried to come back to Chicago. I had Chicago, Vancouver, and I think many were the three teams that I picked for places to live and places that I thought would be good to finish my career and go for a year or two. But but I had four kids, and they were all you know starting school, and, and I – didn't think I could wait till late August or September and say, Hey guys, guess what? We're going to Vancouver. We're going to Minnesota. So I made an August 1st deadline for those teams and said, uh, they all had interest. They all said, you know, um, you know, let's talk as the summer goes on. They had free agents, other free agents to sign other players that they could assign. Uh, and they said, can you be patient with it? And I said, yeah, I'll give you the August 1st. And then on August 1st, I called those teams or my agent did. And, and uh, they were still lukewarm. Yeah, we like them, but we know we need some more time. And that's when I said, you know what, for the kids, for the family, let's stay in San Jose. They can all go back to the same schools they were in the last five years. And we'll move on and, and get ready for the next chapter. Well, as easy as and as smart as that sounds, it was, it was really a struggle. I missed it. Uh, I had great teammates still playing with the Sharks. Gary Suter is the one I will, uh, but Ricci, Thornton, Harvey, Marchment. And those guys wanted me still in the locker room. So they included me in everything they did. They'd come home from a road trip. What they do, my doorbell's ringing at, at 1130 or 1230 at night. And they're at the door saying, come on, we're going out. I jumped out of bed. I'm run, I'm with them. So I still felt part of it, yeah. but I missed the competition. I missed being on that team and in that locker room. And so it took me a long time. And then fortunately for me, uh, about 
It was the following June, uh, Pierre Lacroix called and said, hey, we've got a coaching vacancy available. Would you be interested in coming in for an interview? Bob Hartley needs an assistant. And I was on the next plane. I went straight to the airport, jumped on a plane, got there, uh, got my interview in. And fortunately, I got the job and my my career in coaching uh, started. So had that not happened, Chris and yeah. Tim, I, I would have been a struggle for a bit. Um, you know, I'm not a big drinker. I started to drink yeah. more than I should have. Uh, I, you know, I didn't sleep at night. I missed it terribly. And I missed the competition part of it, and I didn't have anything to fill it with. So uh, it was it was really really difficult. So I I and Chris and both you guys know this. We got lots of teammates and friends that have have had the same struggles. I think we got to do a better job uh, from the players' association to to somehow um, prepare us in a different way than we have been in the past to be ready for that. Because everyone thinks, okay, you made a lot of money, you got you lived yeah. your dream of playing in the NHL. You're done. You're, you're going to be fine. You're not fine. It's just it just doesn't work that way. And uh, so hopefully we can somehow uh, help our current players uh, and certainly our older players that do have struggles, but our current players be ready for that day when you do have to find something else to do to fill your void of, uh, of being a part of a team and being in the NHL and being a, a hockey player. Did you guys find the same things? Can I ask you that question? Yeah. You yeah, find no, the exact go ahead. same things? Go ahead, Tim. Just, no, 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 no. Answer no, your no, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen to him. He, he always corrects know. me the way I – He always says, like, no, no, no. Can he reach you from where he's at? I thought my arms would give a little intimidation, but they don't. I, they it's so do. funny, Tony. I'll ask him about someone, and, and he'll go, Oh, I don't know. No, no, I don't know. And I'm there. <laughs> Fuck you, do know. Say something. We it's, like it's, it's the I way I talk. It's the way yeah. I talk. I do know. No, I don't know. You do know, Tim. No, it's Let um, it fly. <laughs> no, I. What you just said, though, is yeah, 100%. I'm a, I couldn't agree more with the transition. I think um, I know guys that have a lot of money and they still don't, they're kind of lost, right? It's just like not knowing what to do. I feel like I'm still kind of transitioning. It's been five years. Um, but what was I, I lost my question. Oh, when you started coaching, did you get some of that back that you were missing as a player or was it completely Immediately. different? Yeah, I'm in the locker room. I'm, I, I'm on the bench. I'm right there in the action. Part of, you know, all of my preparation each day is focused on, you know, not just myself, now now it's the entire team or it's the power player, it's the penalty killer, or it's the, the young guy we just called up on helping them get ready for the game. So you're right back in, right back into it. So yes, uh, absolutely. I would, trust me, I would have, I coached, I don't know how many games, I would have traded every one of them to play another one, but, but it's, it's, it brings it back to you that part of, uh, of, again, just the camaraderie of being part of something and trying to accomplish something special with your buddies or your teammates. So yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, the um, I struggled, no question. But I, I didn't miss the break of my arm and tearing my knee up or breaking my ankle or the hockey hernia stuff. I didn't miss that. I missed the locker room. Like, everybody says it. I missed that locker room going in the room. I think that's pretty much a um, universal thing when it comes to guys retiring, that – camaraderie that you have in there that coming in every day shooting the shit with the boys and getting ready for practice busting balls talk you know the togetherness the family atmosphere that you have i think is what at least that's what i missed um for sure and in the game somewhat but when your body's all beat up like that i think i also i struggled with that my last year right you know i i remember i told talk to tim about this before but i remember my last year um, I fought Jim McKenzie in, uh, against Hartford, fucking 6'5", whatever he is. And then the next night, the Grim Reaper. And I remember I hung in there with both of them. But I, I remember both times going to the penalty box, I'm going, fuck me. What am this I doing? Is, this is getting tougher. This is getting yeah. harder. They're getting bigger. These kids are where I was when I was coming in. They wanna, They don't care that I'm 34 now. <laughs> they're licking their chops and you know i was the same way and like you know uh, yeah it got hard at the end for me and you know i'm glad i got to retire up here in montreal but um still it was you know, it was difficult transition i got lost and you know where i ended up it's well documented for sure but um 
I'm back, and I'm back with Tim in a big <laughs> yeah. way. Yes. Um, right, Timothy? I love that. Oh, yes. Timothy I, I do. Stuff. I, I told you I'm going to jump in again. I'm going to oh. interrupt. I like interrupting you. Good. So one of the things, too, that, you know, you invited me to the premiere of the, the movie when it came out, the first, what was the name of it again? Last uh, Gladiators. Last Gladiator. And it was in Pittsburgh, and I remember you called me, and you said, hey, can you come to this thing? I was assistant coach in Pitt at the time, and you said, absolutely nuts. I'd love it. And I knew you had some struggles, but when I sat there and watched that film, uh, I, I was overtaken with emotion and somewhat guilt. Uh, and I say this in a, in a respectful way. As teammates, you're always supposed to kind of help others and recognize when they're, you know, they need you. And, and, and I, I felt that somehow I should have been, which I probably wasn't capable of doing because we were living in different places and you always go on your own lives when you're done, uh, that I should have been able to help you as a teammate. And I, I, and I know what you did for me when we were teammates. Why couldn't I have recognized that or others have recognized that and kind of helped you through it? And, and I get it. It, it, was, it, it couldn't happen, but, but I did. I, I told Linda after, I go, man, oh, man, if, I wish I would have been able to have some sort of signal or intuition to call up Chris and say, Chris, how you doing? And then tell me something that I could have helped him before you got to that point. That's mm. where I you know, think that being a hockey player and being a teammate and Tim, I never play with you, Tim. I take you on my team because I think you got character and I think you understand what we're all about as players. That's the most important quality a teammate could have is, is you care more about the teammate than you do yourself. That goes yep. with production. That goes with who scores the goal. I'd rather have you score, Chris or Tim, than me. But I just want to be part of it. And I think you guys felt the same way about you know your teammates. So, so that's I think why you know you mentioned the missing the locker room. That's what we miss. You know, mm. the, the locked in together, let's go type of yeah. uh, relationship slash uh, understanding of what each other meant to one another. That's different. It's different than any other sport. The only thing that I can say might be to the next level would be a military thing when you're in a, you're, you go overseas or you go yeah. do your, you're fighting for your, that's the only thing that I can say, because there you're fighting for each other is protection of each other. It's other's a great life. analogy. And it, it is. And it, military guys understand that too. And it's not to the level they're at when you talk about your life is on the line, but uh, very similar when you talk about that Respect togetherness. And brotherhood. Yeah. It's, it's huge. And, and I, I, when you say that, I wish I could have maybe held that. It, it's, listen, there's no one was going to help me. I but understand my, that. But myself. And I didn't want people to help me. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to try and figure it out on my own. But the only way I could figure it out on my own was fucking waking up from overdose and on a floor mm -hmm. and being so fucking desperate and so beaten rock bottom. down. Going to rock you know? bottom. Yeah. yeah. It's from so beaten down that, you know, I finally picked up the phone and, you know, I made that phone call. But it, and I will tell you, it, the guy I did call, his card was given to me by a former teammate of mine, Bob Ganey. And Bob Ganey had kind of known I was struggling a little bit here. And he said, listen, if you ever need any help, Chris, you know, I know you're struggling. You haven't found a job. The guy here that uh, he works for the NHL, he could maybe help you with some stuff. So I had hung on to his cot. And his name was Dan Cronin. And Dan, okay. uh, actually, I met with him one, you know, at one point and um then that's was my journey in recovery. That was back in 2000. But um, yeah, that um, I know I Dan did, Cronin well. Yeah, Dan, Dan, I love Dan I Cronin's, love him. I love. So Dan do I. Cronin. I just saw him, Timmy. We saw him at the at the Stanley Cup party last week. That's the first time I've seen him since the mid 90s. And I looked at him and I said, "Gosh darn it, I think that's Dan." And I, I we walked over, we gave each other a hug, and we talked a little bit about what you're talking about, Knox. And I can. And, and I should probably some of this I shouldn't share, but he said he's been doing it for 30 some years now and kind of hinted to me at the amount of people that he's helped. And it's unbelievable. I, 
unbelievable. So it, I'm glad that he was you. I don't want to say saving grace, but your 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 spiritual angel, whatever you want to call him, your angel. He's a disciple came, of the good one. He's a disciple. Okay, yeah. and he's done that for so many. So I think that that's and I and I'm going to just kind of explain to you what I'm doing now. I jumped on a board with Clint Malarchuk, uh, who has had his struggles in more ways than one throughout his life that has decided that going through all the experiences he did and coming out of it in a decent place, his objective of, of moving forward is to just help others to hopefully give them a way of understanding there's help out there and there's ways of getting better faster without going to rock bottom. So I want to yeah. pick your brain later when we get out, done with the show about how I can uh, help Clint uh, as well. Uh, and Dan's going to be a part of that as well. But this ranch is for and available for former NHL, current players, anybody that needs somewhere to go to kind of regroup and get back in a, in a good place. And there's lots of help that's provided there. Uh, and it's, it's something that Clint uh, has, uh, has taken on. Uh, so I just joined that board. So it's similar to thinking the same yeah. way uh, about what we're talking about, about so many players Recovery. and players and family members are in need of a little bit of support to get them back on track. Get into the action with Fight Club, Raw Knuckles' new exclusive Patreon. From ad-free episodes to uncensored content and discounts on merch, there's something for every hockey fan. Join the Fight Club today. So the coaching career... Um, Wisconsin, uh, how many years were at Wisconsin? Eight years? Seven. Seven. Seven, seven years at Wisconsin. Uh, you end up leaving there. Um, how difficult was fired. that? Yes. Your passion? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you I got know. fired. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess I'm trying to be yeah. nice. You got your balls cut <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, I get it. I, um, I had I – had, here, I'll tell you about it really quick. I had a tremendous opportunity. I, I loved it. I had a, came back to school that gave me an opportunity. I played four years here uh, and uh, had a chance to come back and kind of try to get the program going. It was struggling a little bit. Uh, I think I brought a lot back to it on some of the ideas that I had on getting it back. Uh, I'm really proud of the kids and the players that I was able to coach. Uh, but to be quite you know, honest with you, I had a, a difference of opinion on a couple of people that were uh, in, in the administration that I didn't see eye to eye with on the direction that we wanted to go. And we butted heads and uh, my stubbornness, uh, I wouldn't give in. And I fought for what I thought was right for the That'll players back to what you said a little while ago. Um, and and I went down the way I wanted to go down. I went down uh, with, you know, doing what I thought was right for the program and for the players that I was coaching. Uh, I had, you know, I, I you know, we're, the season's going to get started here in, in, in a couple of weeks. And, you know, I, you get the excitement, you know, of, of going into a locker room. And, and as a coach, you know, you really get a tremendous opportunity to say, OK, why are you coaching? Uh, are you coaching just to win? Are you coaching just to make money? You know, what drives you to coach? And, and really, at that point in my career, I came back to coach college. Things were going really well in the NHL. I was having a blast as an assistant coach. I probably had, a, well, I did have some opportunities to move on and be a head coach in the NHL in the past 10 years that I walked away from to stay in college. And the, and the reason for that was because you mentioned Steve Reed, you mentioned one of your other counselors in high school, yeah. helped you get on track and give you a path to uh, your life and career. And I thought, geez, man, that's really rewarding to have a chance to coach Cole Caulfield, who we've talked about yeah. numerous times, Chris. Yeah. Uh, Dylan Holloway, who just signed with St. Louis. I could Keandre Miller and the Rangers. I mean, there's, I mean, I've been so blessed. Not just players that have gone on to make it to the NHL. I was just at another guy's wedding a couple of days ago, a former player that I coached, and to be with these kids uh, that I coached and realize that they've advanced, that they've gone on in life to have absorbed the lessons and, and understood that you know what you can learn in hockey carries over into the real world as a parent, as a neighbor, and uh, as an employee, whatever it is. That became more important to me. Uh, than just sticking around the NHL and, and trying to, to, you know, to, that's to make awesome. it there. So, so, yeah. so that's my take on it. I would, I'm disappointed that I, I'm not still there as a coach, but in a blessing way, I, I lost my job. I, I, decided, I discovered I had cancer. Had I been coaching, I might not have ever discovered that until it was too late. So, yeah. uh, 
you know, because I would have ignored the symptoms. I would have said, I'm coaching, I'm tired, I'm not suck going to the doctor. Suck it up. Yeah. This, suck it up. So in a way, this all of the timing of how things have happened in my life have happened for a reason. I believe that. And, uh, and again, I'm very grateful for those seven years of coaching. You can see a jersey in the background, 87. Yeah. I had the thrill of coaching him in, in Pittsburgh. I had Datsuk, Zetterberg, Cronwell in Detroit. I had Sackick, Forsberg, Haydu, Blake, Wah, wow, all those guys in Colorado. Yeah. I've been lucky. I've been so, so lucky. And then all the teammates I had along the way that I've been able to play with. You know, I got... I got stuff. I, you, we, we talked earlier about, you know, remembering things and, and about, you know, your career and talking about your career. I don't care about that. I look back at my team pictures and see knuckles on there with Guy LaFleur, or Marcel Dion, Ron Greshner, Brian Lee, right you know, right there. I, like, I that's it. Right that, that's, the, that's the part that's so cool. Right uh, there, Tony. We're going to show it. Let's see if I can turn this thing around enough. Uh, You're pretty good with that. Just I, I see you see it. In the penalty box up there. Yeah, I see yeah, that. Yeah. Right up. I see the Ranger, the Ranger picture. picture. I got it. Yeah, I just got yeah. a cool glimpse of so. it. But, but yeah. Um, so so I think you know when you get to be old. I'm 60 now, Chris. You're probably a little bit older, Timmy. You're about half our age, I think. Um, the things you appreciate uh, in the different ways are just that the relationship. So you know, Nux and I talked to each other a few days ago. With the call was, hey, can you be on the show? I said, absolutely. And we talked, I don't know how many more minutes, 30 more minutes about life and different things we have experienced and gone through. And that's what, the, I guess, again, makes hockey so special, are those relationships that happened in 1988, 89 was the last time we were teammates, but that didn't matter. It still felt like we were in the locker room together. And, and that's yeah. what I uh, cherish, cherish most. Yeah, I it's don't even funny. know if I answered your question. I was about Wisconsin. Yeah, and somehow yeah. Got well, you got your balls cut minutes. off. And, and, <laughs> yeah, you got, oh, your, man. You got your I balls cut off. Too much. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, and, that's you nice. know, t- talking about that, um, you know, you have players that you coach and how lucky you are. And I honestly, I coached two years in the East Coast Hockey League, and I had so much fun doing that. And I never realized the impact that I had on the players until years later, I got guys, like quite a few of them said, you're the best coach I ever played for. And I only coached two fucking years down there. And I, you know, certainly wish I, I, I stayed with it at the time, but I just, things went, went bad. But I was happy doing that, really happy doing that. And and when I hear guys say that to me now, and I'm like, ah, come on, you both. No, I'm serious, Chris. You were my favorite coach, the favorite coach I played for, and that felt good. It's a bit in in a, my own little selfish way, like it felt good, like I had an impact on guys. I remember I, the guys came to me. A couple guys came to me with problems off the ice they had. Then I, you know, talked to them about it, and one one in particular I remember and it really helped the kid in a big way. He was fucking lost on, on, on something. He had an issue uh, that he didn't think he could um, alleviate the, the, the issue. He couldn't alleviate the problem that was in front of him. And I made some suggestions to him and he ended up taking them. And he came back to me later. I can't believe, but thank you so much. And like, it meant a lot. <laughs> I was glad I, I, you make a difference in someone's life, whether you think so or not, you do. Yeah, you You do. And and this, again, this isn't a a blow smoke type of a a comment, but you you have different groups that you meet with consistently and and you're having the same impact on those groups because you share your story and your, your struggles to try to help them understand that. And this is, this is the thing, again, I learned from Clint, which is so, so appropriate. It's okay not to be okay. And earlier in the show, we talked about, you know, being, Tim, you asked about being scared. Well, it wasn't okay to be scared. It wasn't back then. But it's okay for me to say that I'm not okay now when things are okay. And that's something new that I realized from Clint. He, he's not going to have, every day is not going to be okay for, for him. And he's still dealing with 
counseling. He's still dealing with medication. He's still dealing with tools that he can help him get through the struggles. He's got horses and animals that when he's yeah. stressed and he's having anxiety, he goes and spends time with animals. He finds yeah. a way to get back. And I think that that's been a really important lesson too, that you have shared with lots of others uh, by being on those calls and parts of those groups that you will, you know, again, they're going to keep calling you, Chris. It's not just the players that you coached back then. It's the people that you're dealing with yeah, every day. I and appreciate I appreciate that. Tim, mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, where'd you get the sweater? I want to get one of them. So oh, does, it, does it really work like that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, you got look, guns. It looks good. No, right? there air, you know, you got an air thing in there that you can blow up. I know. I it's, think it was just Jamie. getting bigger. That as the show's going on, they're just getting bigger. No, Tony, yeah. you have to you have to come to the golf tournament next year. Uh, but I think I mean, it was Jamie. She said, "God, someone came to me and said, God, Tim's bigger than I thought he was. Like Tim was fucking jacked. He, I think he had a small uh, golf shirt on too that day, but." People yeah, came to me and said, God, fucking Tim's Jack. <laughs> I know. Well, maybe he's lifting. I don't know. <laughs> lifting, yeah. Tim, you know? What was your playing weight, Timmy? What was your playing weight? 75. Okay. I yeah. was in that same. I got to that ballpark. My program weight was 185. I got to that when I was uh, retired. I never, I never played at 185. I think I got to 181-ish maybe at, later in my career. Yeah, it's heavy. The, the uh, piggyback off what you said though about not it's okay to not be okay it's also like you're only as sick as your secrets is another thing i've learned i like and that I, even thinking like what you're talking nux about that you're the guy you coached that i mean just the fact that he came and talked to you about it i think it's like the yeah. biggest i mean it's a huge huge thing is being able to talk about it yeah you're only as sick as your secrets yeah. try and do the next right thing and put one one foot after the other foot and just hold your head up, stiffen up the backbone, chest <laughs> out. Away you go, baby. Wear, wear yeah. tight shirts. and something. Yeah, wear tight yeah. shirts. And... <laughs> Listen, Tony, um, yeah, geez, I could I could talk to you all day here, no question. Um, uh, let me ask, uh, what, I guess, what would be something that maybe one thing that's, someone doesn't know about Tony Granado that you could share with us. Something you don't know about Tony Granado. Yeah. Tip, like, that's a, that one's a tough one. Cause like I'm Tony pretty, Twist was an pretty, artist. He's an artist. We oh didn't know gosh. So, yeah. you, want, you want just one hockey story? Stefan Mateau, can, when you get Stefan Mateau on, he'll confirm the story. I told, did I tell you the story the other day, Timmy? About, no, no, about no. You don't know about this? Someone just no. asked me about about some of the dumb things I did when I was playing. I did a lot of dumb things mm -hmm. in the hockey game. Uh, but this one might have topped it all off. So we're playing in St. Louis. I'm playing for San Jose. And I, you know this, Knox, and I probably learned this from you. If a big guy pushed me, I have to push him twice. If a big, big guy stuck me, I had to stick him twice. I wasn't backing down. In other words, if they pushed me one foot, I push him back two feet. That's just was the mentality I had as a smaller player. So... We're lined up right against the players' benches, right at center ice, but on the wall, not in the center ice dot. So both benches, I'm right wing, which so my bench is right behind me. Tony Twist is left wing. His bench is kind of right behind him. And sure, Tony tries to go over the the halfway point for the faceoff, and and I don't like it. So I give him this one, and he he what? And until so the refs get over there, they blow the whistle, they sort us back out. You know, and he's like, I'm going to freaking kill you, you little son of a whatever. And I'm laughing at him, you know, because, again, I'm too dumb to be scared. And um, I got this little trick that I like to use on guys like that. So I just put my skate right on the top of his boot. And as soon as the puck drops, I push really hard, and it makes him fall forward flat on his face. So I did it to perfection, maybe the best one I've ever done. He gets up, and his gloves are off before his head hit the ice. And he's coming up after me. And I had Jeff Norton on the back end. He saw everything that was going on. He jumped in between. The refs get over there as fast as they can because Twister would have killed me. But he never really <laughs> got to me to, to be able to kill me. So as this is all happening, the refs grab me and the refs grab the, the Twister and they try to get us to the box. Well, there's no refs to defend Kelly Chase and Stefan Mateau. So Chaser and Mateau were lined up on the right wing. 
And Steph had a, a bad thumb at the time. He was taped up. He couldn't squeeze or grab onto a jersey. And Chaser schooled them around the entire rink. They were they were they were dangling the entire rink, and Steph took a beating. So Steph <laughs> is so pissed at me for for doing that to Tony Stop. Twist <laughs> that he'll never ever ever forgive me. So every time we see each other, he looks at me. He goes, "Why you do that? Why you do that?" And uh, uh, and I say, sorry, sorry, Steph. Uh, it's just something <laughs> I did. I'm not proud of it, and I apologize for what Chaser did to you. But it it made for a good story, and it has for many many years. <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. You know what I was going to ask? All right, you know how they have the Michigan now. And I Michigan remember you what? pulled the, the, the Michigan, oh, the move. Oh, oh, oh yes. The thing that come out of Wisconsin, Wisconsin. No. Back in the day, and you did it. I remember you going down the wing, and Chelly used to do this, going from your forehand to shooting the opposite direction. So if you're righty, come in, yeah. cut in on the net. And didn't you score a goal like that in L.A. one night where you came across? I, I think you were my you, lineman that night. Yeah, you I shot was, left. Was you I shot used you as a decoy. Yeah, you, yeah. you come down. He come down, pulled it to – across his body, and then switched hands and went five-hole. I don't know. I think it was Kelly Rudy. I don't know if fucking – Glenn Healy. Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Healy. Healy. Unbelievable, Tim. But that that was like a Wisconsin thing, right? That was like the no, Michigan before no, the Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't Michigan. I would never practice that. Like, I don't like the Michigan because I think too many guys, instead of doing better and more productive things in practice – are fooling around with the Michigan for 30 minutes every day. Oh, yeah, they can do it. Yeah, and yeah. they might do it in the game once every four years. Go stand in front of the net like Joe Pawalski and tip a 1,000 pucks each day, and you're going to probably get 28 goals instead of one goal. Might be better for your career. Now, That's today's just... player will say, come on, coach. Come on. Come yeah. on. Right? But nobody puts likes on your Twitter when you, when you do that, when you <laughs> yeah, get a tip-in yeah. goal. Nobody likes yeah. tip-in goals. They like the Michigan thing. So, so I'm with Tortorelli. I remember John. Remember John flipped out yep. on that a few years ago and just yep. snapped on it. I'm. I definitely would support John's uh, lack of uh, excitement for uh, a goal that scored Michigan like style. Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't do it either. I I, I know. I, I couldn't do it. I didn't want to do it. I guess it's probably more of it than anything. Um, but well, I don't. Oh, the the, the left handed goal with Chelios. Chelly did it a lot. I, I did it. You know what's funny, Nux? I did it when my wrists were bothering me uh, one way or another. I had an injury, I did, and it didn't feel comfortable shooting righty. Lots of times when you're screwing around before practice, I'd fool around lefty, and I just became comfortable doing it. And, and I don't think I ever really tried to do that. I think that just was the only play that I had at that time was to pull it that way and then go lefty. Uh, and, you know, it Lucky it went in. That's all. But that's. I'm glad you remember that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Oh, I, do. That I remember. It was in L.A. I remember. Um, geez. Um, to hell. Do you want you want to know one more story about that one? Since we're talking about L.A. Go that right was, ahead. That was the game that Jan Erickson. You remember Johnny? What was Johnny's job? Oh, I love Jan Erickson. Yeah. He was Shadow, the other team's best player. Right, yeah. so he was going to have Gretzky that night, and Michelle Bergeron, the guy we loved and talked about earlier, yeah. skates up to me in morning skate. He's all fired up. He comes around and he's doing a lap with me. He comes by me. He goes, "Hey, Grado, Tony, you got Gretzky tonight. You shadow him." And then he skated away. And I'm going around the rink, going, "He could not have just said that." We got Jan Eriksson, one of the best checking wingers ever. I've never been asked a defensive responsibility in my life, let alone to try to do it to Gretzky. So I skate back up to him, you know, I'm, hey, coach, you know, what do you want me to do again? He go, you go Gretzky. He go take, he go bathroom, you go bathroom too. Wherever he go, you go. And I'm going, he's being serious. I got this assignment tonight. I couldn't sleep a wink that afternoon. I was petrified because my game is being dirty, you know, and kind of whacking guys and yapping at them. And I'm not going to do that to Wayne Gretzky. There's no way I'm doing that to Wayne Gretzky. So I had to turn into a checker in four hours and my afternoon nap was all about how am I going to do this? And it was the greatest probably challenge and responsibility I've been given as a professional player. And we won the game. I scored that goal. Uh, I got one penalty for hooking Gretz. I didn't whack him. I didn't slash him. I didn't, 
yap at him. I didn't cross check him. I just played him hard and in front of him. And, and it's somewhat kind of funny because when I got traded to New York or sorry, I got traded to LA that next year, Bruce McNall brought that game up. And he said, uh, you know, after that game you played last year in the forum, Wayne said, we got to get that guy on our team. So I feel really good when I got to LA that Wayne actually knew who I was right? and that I became part of his team. Uh, that, that was, uh, so, so anyways, it was a very, probably my most memorable game as a, as a player because it was so unique to be told you're shadowing Gretzky. It's funny when the coach asks you to do something that, I guess, is not in line with your game. Now, same coach came to me, and I don't know if you remember this, but we were in, I think it was Cleveland or Cincinnati playing an exhibition game, and he, I came in the locker room, and there was a C on my jersey, and he said, uh, tonight you're my captain. And I said, Bergy, I don't want to be the fucking captain. I'm not a captain. I don't need a letter. No, tonight you are my captain. And I said, I don't want the fucking thing. He said, well, you're wearing it. I went out. Fuck, we got a penalty. So I got a penalty for something. I argued with the ref, Rob Schick. And he said, no, fucking don't come. I said, fuck, I can't come and talk. No, you can't. I said, fuck you. He kicked me out of the game. <laughs> Bergy, that was your one game as captain. That was my one game as captain. Bergy came. Maybe it was before you got there. And, and, yeah. and Bergy goes, what the fuck? I fucking yeah. tell you to be. I said, I fucking told you I didn't want to be captain. I'm t It was so funny. And and I, I think back, were you there when he uh, James Patrick ran into him, right? At the garden yes. and he fell and hit his elbow yeah. in his head. Yeah. And, oh, and yeah. remember, like, like yeah. two days before, he, he went around the room and he's giving it to guys. He gave it to Mark Hardy. He said, Mark Hardy, tabarnak. I remember in the Quebec League, you used to be tough, call this. And yes. Hardy's like just sitting there. So that day, James hits him. He goes up, hits his head and his elbow. He's on the ice going, oh, fuck. Oh, he's Stick like, went flying everything. Right? Yeah, everything. And then we all come over concerned. And Hardy goes, oh, tabarnak, Bergy. I remember in the Quebec League, you used to be tough. Oh. He goes, fuck you. He's all, oh, I'm telling you, he was, he was just, I, I love playing for him. Bergy was awesome. He, he, he listen, I've never seen a guy do what he did with you and Leachy. All right. Okay. They came in together from the Olympic team, right, Tim? Both rookies. And they're both, you know, vying for rookie of the year. I never seen a coach be able to support two guys in, T through the media like he did, not favoring one over the other. He was unbelievable at that, Bergie. He, he, he was awesome, right? He was. He was uh, fantastic. Again. Uh, Do you remember that, though, in the media, how he was? He 100%, was 100 percent. But I'm thinking bigger picture. And I'm thinking of my teammates more so than I am. Of Bergie course because, you are. But I'm thinking of him. Yeah. OK. Well, he, you know, he allowed, that, you know, he, whatever. Yes, I agree. But, but the other thing was, Chris, you got to remember, I started on your line, right? We played together quite a bit early, especially yeah. then I played with Guy and Marcel for a while. First 40 games or so, I never, I don't think I touched a power play. And that was the best thing for me. Yeah. I was a penalty killer. I had to grind it out. I had to do all these other things again to polish my game instead, instead of just trying to be a scorer or try to be an offensive player. He helped me a lot that way. And uh, at the time, you're like wondering, geez, it's going pretty well. Maybe I'll get a power play, you know, shift here or there. And it never really happened until Christmas when I think we traded. Uh, well, Donnie Maloney got traded and Kerry Wilson came over. I, I started to play with Sandstrom and, and Kerry at that time. And uh, uh, but I, I really like how Bergie handled me and taught me, uh, you know, the, the intensity and competitiveness and all that stuff that those those he loved us. Yeah, so he that, did. You know, all these tabernacle, all that yeah. stuff he would say at us was just to get us fired up. It wasn't derogatory, yeah. nor, nor to take it personal. This guy's fired up. He wants to win. Yeah. And uh, and I love that that uh, uh, what he brought, what he how he helped me. But uh, but again, it was the your, you guys as older teammates. You're always scared, and I try to teach younger players this. This is the most important thing for a young player listening that's trying to walk into an NHL locker room and make it. 
it doesn't matter if the coach likes you. It doesn't matter where you get drafted. You have to walk in there and understand the players in that room are going to determine whether or not you make it. If you go in there and you respect them and you, you know, you, you know, you walk up, Hey Knox, thanks a lot. Hey Gee, you know, I appreciate whatever. And, and you just, you know, take a back seat to everything and just respect them. You guys will help and, and accept me as, okay, he gets it. This guy understands what being part of a team is. Yeah. If I walked in there and said, hey, I should be on the fucking power play. Hey, Nux, you know, go beat that guy up for me. Hey, Gee, yeah, come yeah. here, pass the puck to me. I'm done. I don't make it. Yeah. And, and lots of kids in today's world think that that's the way it goes. And right. well, how it goes is you walk into that room, you better respect because they're, you're taking someone else's job and somebody, a buddy in that room has to get out for you to get in. And if you're in a team, and Chris, you know it, and Tim, you know it too, you got this camaraderie amongst the group. If you're bringing someone in, he better help you win, and he better understand and bring something that, that is right for the team. If not, I want my buddy here too. So you make it miserable on that guy. I'll give you – you remember – you'll remember this, Chris, because we had a younger player get called up later in the year that didn't understand that. He got shaved. He got beat up. He got you, – you'll, it'll come to you. He, he, you know, he didn't want to skate because it was too hard one day. And he went off the Kirk? ice, and, and I'm not saying who, but but okay. but he's a great he's a great kid and great player. But but didn't quite. Leachy and I, I think, understood that one. We were a little bit older. One, we had the Olympic year together, and and um, you know, fitting into an NHL locker room is easy if you make it be about the other the team. If you want to make it be a little bit about yourself. You're done. You ain't making it. Yeah, yeah that's I know my what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, okay. I got you. And yeah, it, you're right on the money. There's no question about it. And, uh, yeah, that that part never changes. You got to be you got to be in with the boys. You got to show that respect. And that's how you get in there, not by fucking coming in and taking over, you know. But, Tony, um, thank you so much, buddy, uh, for doing this. Uh, awesome friend and teammate. And uh, I really, really, I love you, kid. And I just hope love you too, buddy. when you get this um, your latest news, I hope it's good news for you as far as uh, dealing with your uh, disease. And hopefully you get to the other side of that and you never have to look back. Or when you do look back at it, uh, you certainly go, ha, I beat that one too. So good stuff. I like stuff. that. That's awesome. Yeah, Timmy, send me your bicep exercises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm from this. I, I want to keep this. I was gonna throw it out, but I'll keep it now. Oh, <laughs> that, that's that a good cra- one. It's crazy. I know, right? So I gotta, I'm gonna that's, send that. That's Look Tony. Little Busta. Johnny. Little Busta. Yeah. Little Busta in the front. Who would have known? Right? Gary Shuchuk. That was Gary that was Shuchuk. Donnie Granado hockey school. That wasn't my school. That was Donnie's. You were Donnie right. always. I got Donnie understood Donnie. the game way better than me and could teach it way better than me from a really young age. He he actually helped me a lot. Uh, he's a few years younger, but he helped me understand the game in a different way. Like I was just speed and fast and play the game and recklessly, and he slowed it down. This is what you got to pay attention to uh, as far as being able to use your teammates and this and that. He really taught me a lot about the game. Yeah, yeah. He's a so there's a plug awesome. for my but we've got Cammy. We already plugged Cammy. Now we're gonna get Donnie. <laughs> yeah, yeah.